Welcome everyone to tonight's webinar. Um, we're privileged tonight to have Tembo Tembu from Zululand, who's going to give us a talk on birding in Zululand. I was very fortunate to meet Tembo many years ago uh, when I went down to the, Nibila, the, the Zululand area and we needed rosy throated long claw for me and my, for my group. And Tembo was the man. So he took us around Nibila Peninsula, showed us the long claw and a number of other bonus birds. Uh, I think it was uh, pink throated twin spot. Uh, Rudds of Palis, etc. And um, since then, I've had the opportunity to bird with Temba quite a few times. And I really enjoy his company, his incredible knowledge of the area, his generosity uh, with his knowledge is, is something special. And I think he serves as, a, as a, an ambassador to all, uh, for all the, the regional guides in the Zululand region. So tonight, it's a great pleasure to have Temba. Um, uh, I'm going to, Tim is going to speak to uh, using PowerPoint slides and because of technology, I'm running those from my end. So I'm going to switch over and show the slides and then Tim will climb right in. Ladies and gentlemen, hi, thank you so much, Etienne. Um, I really appreciate an opportunity and um, I would love to thank you guys for making up some time for this. It's really great. You have got no idea. And thank you so much for just presenting yourself to this webinar. It's such a wonderful uh, uh, time we're going to spend together. Um, just as Etienne has said, I just would like to thank him, particularly, including Derek, for making sure that this webinar uh, becomes a success. And also, just definitely love to thank all of you for making some time for this. It's really great. Thank you so much. And I also try and thank very few uh, uh, wonderful people in my life, like Tandi Shabalala of Fish Mangalis Wetland Park, Elmarie Mostert for uh, offering the use of her pictures just free of charge. Thank you so much, Elmarie. Beggy Mabiga from East Mangalisa, Roland Forwick, Asher Glassy, Duncan Pritchard, Gary Robin, Peter Shadwick, Stuart Madsen, and many, many others. I, I thank you all, guys. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Without wasting so much time, I'll also try and just quickly introduce myself so that you are all aware of uh, who Timber is. If you can just quickly check from the title, it says from humble beginning of being a notorious bear egg hunter to a bear entrepreneur. Yes, it's all about that. Uh, the same island that Etienne just mentioned, Nibela Peninsula, is one in the same uh, a wonderful piece of ground where it all began. Um, Nibela Peninsula is on the northern tip end of the lake, St. Lucia, and it's a beautiful, um, important bedding area in the whole of South Africa. In fact, it's one of the IBAs as known by many. People want to go there for some special, such as rosy trotted long claw, lemon breasted canaries, near God sunbirds and many, many others. Yeah, that should be a best place for you to go. So I just grew up there, spending much of my time on the edge of the lake with my cousin, of which I really didn't enjoy that much, precisely because I wasn't more into fishing. I wasn't more into fly fishing because it had to take so much time for the fish to come and bite. As a result, that was not my thing. So I decided to go out with my uncles and started hunting with them. And that's um, just empowered me with more skills for hunting. So I had to hunt birds eggs, I had to hunt birds for feathers, I had to hunt small antelopes, obviously for food and not as a serious advanced poaching of today. But that was only done just for food as every local member of the family could just do. So that's how I have to do it. But you see, because on the other hand, I was also exposed to quite a lot of uh, ecotourism activities from the nearby Pinda Game Reserve that kept bringing a lot of people onto the edge for bed watching. I had to find myself sometimes being introduced to those great bedders, but I never had interest up until one day, one of the ranger had to invite me and he pulled me close to the scope to try and see the magnificent, beautiful colors of the birds on the scope of which was a first of his kind for me. So that night I couldn't sleep. It was one of those incredible nights. Yeah, 
but then I knew that I have to do this um, from time to time. So they couldn't come from time to time onto the edge of the lake, but every time they come, me and my cousin, we had to help them with firewoods because sometimes they sit around the fire and we tell them some stories on the edge of the lake, St. Lucia, where they were just busy doing their bed list, you see. But you know, I have got to be inquisitive from time to time to ask the ranger uh, why he was a, a bird guide and how to become a bird guide. Well, he tried to explain himself thoroughly well, which led me to take so much interest into this. One day I was invited into Zinkwazi camp up in Pinda, and that's where I enjoyed a great experience with their trainees uh, who were involved in field guiding. And I was just taken out on some field excursions and I had to start identifying birds from there. And for me, that was a great experience. I knew I have to do it, although it wasn't something in line with my parents' settings who already wanted me to do sort of criminal law, which I did and never practiced. But uh, later on, I realized, okay, I need to follow my heart. And I was so lucky I got linked up with bed life through Roland Forwake and Duncan Pritchard, um, who used to work for Bed Life at the time. And that's how I got hooked up to Bed Life. I did that course in Vakastrum, which is in Pumalanga province. And that's so me, you know, having a great interest and knowledge in birds. And, and it seriously developed me as so much because I never ever had more serious advanced knowledge about birds um, until I went to attend that course. Yeah, that's how it all began. And from there, I have got to go home, becoming um, a, a small bidding entrepreneur. And some of my local people, they look at me and they thought I was mad with binoculars and cameras. They didn't exactly understand what I was doing, but I have from time to time tried to explain myself. But there were challenges in conservation at the time because my local people did not understand um, conservation they did not understand even bird watching so I was the only one in the in the whole community to do that so uh, there was <coughs> there was pressure uh, to try and educate the local communities which I will try and discuss more in details with you later thank you yeah um as you know, this KwaZulu Natal is such a huge province, so I'm not going to try and detail the whole interesting bird watching all over the province, but I will try and stick a little bit more on the northeastern side of Zululand along the route to Mozambique, East Mangalese Wetland Park. So that's a park I just want to talk a little bit more about. And, and, and I know this map. Etienne, is it possible to help and get Nduma, um, the one with Nduma cameras there? I know Zululand is huge. Yeah, thank you so much, Etienne. You can see exactly where Etienne is pointing. That's a small little park or, or reserve on the northern uh, tip end of uh, South Africa along the route to Mozambique. In fact, it's adjacent to the border of Mozambique. But all along, it's been known as a bird spreading spot uh, with more than 430 bird species have recorded in its conservation area. So when I got there, I had the assumption that I was going to make so much business. But unfortunately, the area was also way out of range. And at that time, to get to Njimu Game Reserve, you have to drive on that horrible gravel road, which could take you for up to an hour to get there. And lot of small cars like Sedan couldn't make it. Only four by four at the time were able to do it. So yeah, I also realized, no, I'm not able to make the business in that area. That's just why I decided to change my mindset and come back to St. Lucia. And of course, when I came to St. Lucia, St. Lucia always looked like a tourism hub. There were a lot of people flocking into St. Lucia to do quite a wide range of different activities. And I said to myself, yeah, I think this is a place where I need to be. And then I tried to go around, speak to a few people. I tell them that I was a bird guide. And at first, some people couldn't trust me, you know, because they didn't want to send out their own people with their own guy, you know? So, but I had to prove myself. So I had to go out to a few tour operators into the bush and try to, uh, to prove myself if I know the birds. And it looks like, yeah, they, uh, they approved me for that because eventually they started trusting me and they sent out their people with me. So it seemed to have worked, um, it seemed to have worked. And um, from there, the word of the mouth obviously also got me out. I mean, a lot of people, they learned about me and yeah, and that's how it all happened. Thank you.
Getting to Isimangalisa Wetland Park, uh, you know, you know, Zululand is quite a huge area. So unfortunately, I'm not going to speak uh, to cover the whole Zululand. Zululand is an amazing place, but it's huge. So I will try and stick a little bit more on the northeastern coast of the country, which is Isimangalisa Wetland Park. And that's owing to its um, uniqueness. The park is amazing. It's, a, it's, a, it's got its status as a World Heritage Site in December 1, 1999, owing to all the uniqueness that the park has. Um, you will agree with me if you look at Southern Africa as a whole, it's a land area of approximately 3.5 billion square kilometers. But of course, it does hold such a high base diversity. I've heard that at least uh, we hold about 10% of the whole world birds population. And Zululand alone has got about 605 bird species. And St. Lucia, East Mangaliso, as well as all the small little pocket of conservation areas within its boundaries, they could hold for up to 528 bird species. So that's a lump sum. I mean, this makes us better than most of your conservation area in the country. But of course, the advantage that we have is the, the biodiverse habitat types that we get in the area from lakes, uh, islands, uh, vegetated sand dunes, coastal, dry forest, um, lakes, pens, rivers, Indian Ocean. We got all in one. In fact, I can just say straight away, if Africa was a bird, it's Mangalisa Wetland Park should be one slice out of it. Now, having said that, out of all the places where is Mangalisa Wetland Park, okay, you got these two division. You got the Eastern Shore side and you have got uh, the Western Shores side. The Eastern Shore side is an area more on the seaward edge of Marine Reserve. Um, and it comprises mainly of the vegetated sand dunes. So it's just the sand dunes with a lot of uh, coastal forest on top of it, huge trees of milkwood and all other giant uh, trees that you could try to think of. They grow up on this particular type of habitat. The vegetated uh, sand dunes is such a special habitat again, because it's rated the second highest in the world after Fraser Island in Australia. It's about 187 meters, it's still host quite a lot of bad life. Currently along the eastern shores, we got some very good uh, sightings of your rufous bellied heron, okay? So people who want to come quickly and see the rufous bellied heron, they can either book with me or they can just try to do it themselves and just drive towards the eastern shores and they will be lucky to find this bit in one of the pens in the eastern shores. But Eastern Shores habitat is also very special in, 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 the, in, the, in, in some of the special bits that is all, it's able to provide our visitors, like your Southern Branded Snake, Eagles, Senegal Lepwings, and many, many more that we can try to talk about later. Coming up to Bempe Pants. Bempe Pants is kind of an extension of the Lake St. Lucia flood plains. It's, it's been wonderful. I mean, it's been beautiful from time to time. There's quite a lot of African periactic migraine that have been landing in that piece of wetland from time to time. Things like your Caspian plovers have been there, your yellow wagtails have been there, um, um, uh, lesser jacanas. I know recently uh, you also have got um, um, uh, the lesser mohen. There's, yeah, there is a lesser mohen around there. So it's such a beautiful place, uh, Bamber Pens. And False Bay. False Bay is quite amazing. It's just a very small park. It's such a very small park. There's not too much road in False Bay. It's more on the western shores of uh, East Mangalese Wetland Park. But it's beautiful in the fact that it's comprising mainly a dry sand forest habitat, which is home to most sought after Niagara sunbirds, African broadbill. Um, and many other dry sand forest species that you could try and think of. Your eastern nicota, your grated flycatchers, yeah, and many, many more. They do okay in these habitats. Um, the western shores, so I've just said now, at St. Lucia Town and the estuary itself. Well, well, not to mention the estuary, there is quite a lot happening down for the Lake St. Lucia estuary. Um, I was just there a few hours ago, actually trying for the Galbut Tan. The Lake St. Lucia Estuary has been amazing. I know a lot of people 
they, they've known Lake St. Lucia estuary when it was linked to the Indian Ocean many years ago. But unfortunately, in the year 2003, we had uh, an old Italian oil tanker. We had an incident with an old Italian oil tanker, Julie Rubino, that went aground. And because the 10 wildlife officials has just decided to, to be of good idea to try and close the Lake St. Lucia mouth from the sea because they were trying to uh, close uh, or stop oil spires from contaminating the lakes. But at that time, okay, anyway, we waited so long before we opened up the mouth again. And so that connection has got to be lost. But from uh, the funding from the World Bank, what they have also done was to try and divest the Lake St. Lucia Mountain to Umpolos River. Now we know uh, with heavy rain, Umpolos River has been flooding a lot of silt into the lake. And those silt leave some sort of nice mud flats. And that has been from time to time, very attractive to some of the African paroeactic migrants. You know, they seem to enjoy our shoreline on that side. A bit like your Eurasian oyster catcher, um, 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 Eurasian oyster catcher, Eurasian calus, they have also visited uh, uh, the, our mud flats, which is quite very, very stunning at the moment. So yeah, we hopefully believe that um, these African paroeactic migrants will try and breed someday, you never know, because if they get here and they feel welcome, why the, why the hell not? Well, why should they not breed? Yeah, so sometimes you never know. So, but that's my prayer that someday they will have to end up breeding. We got like three types of migrants, remember? We got uh, an African paroeactic migrant, uh, which uh, are this, uh, of the bird species that's migrated from the geographical um, uh, periactic region, which is Northern Hemisphere all the way to the Southern Hemisphere, uh, things like your Eurasian oyster catcher that I've just said now. And then you have got sort of altitudinal migrant, those that migrate from the higher to, to the lower altitude or vice versa. And then you got your, your intercontinental migrant, those that migrate just within the continent. So it's been so impressive to see quite a lot of um, African periactic migrant visiting the lake um, St. Lucia mouth at present. And that as a result um, is just, of course, attracting quite a large number of bedders to try and tick those beds. They may not have them because remember most of our local people, they will be used to the beds that okay locally. So we're quite very uh, excited to have the birds that come from far because you know they're saving us even some time, especially during lockdown, you can't just travel to UK or United States. So, but these birds, they can just make it easier for us. So, yeah. Thank you, uh, yeah. I think at the end you can move on to the oh, other one. Yeah, this species of birds in the picture is called Southern Banded Snake Eagle. It's a beautiful snake eagle. You can see nice gray hood, a gray head, a beautiful bars. And um, you also have got beautiful uh, bands on the tail as well. He's one of the snake eagles. He mainly specializes on snakes, spotted bush snakes, uh, olive grass snakes. But of course, he have also been recorded taking some frogs and weasels. It's quite a beautiful bit, okay? Um, they also occur okay along the eastern shores of the Simangaliso Wetland Park, but their range distribution, if you check in your African map, they can occur as far as Western Somalia, all the way further down to, or I mean, all the way further up to Mozambique. So yeah, they, uh, they got such a very good range expansion, but restricted, of course, along the coast. There are a hell lot of uh, uh, issues about the breeding range of uh, the species, the Southern Banded Snake Eagle, and Bed Life South Africa, I think, is doing all they can to try and find out what the problems are. I think Dr. Melissa is heading that research program, if I'm not um, mistaken. I know I was also involved in one uh, research a few years ago. But uh, the birds' uh, breeding does not look good at all. Remember, they could just have only one egg, and the male can sometimes take an early morning hours for incubation and just let the girls sit in the eggs all day long while he's going out to try and look for food. But we, we have got no understanding as to why the numbers are striking. There are about 650 to 2,000 birds in Africa, but uh, uh, in South Africa, 
all I've heard is that the pairs are struggling between 40 to uh, 50 birds. So that's not enough. There must be something wrong. Of the population occurring within um, uh, uh, Southern Africa or Sadiq region, you got, um, um, you, you got uh, the Southern Mozambique one, you got um, um, the, the, the Middle Mozambique one, which is an area which includes Baria and Zambezi, and you also have Coast of Western uh, Zimbabwe side. So, but we wish like the bears could improve their numbers and do more, but yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be. Thanks, Etienne. You can move on to the other one. The Niagat sunbirds. It's such a beautiful uh, sunbirds as you can see. I know that many people, they can intend to confuse him with the Merico, but the Merico seems to have quite a very long decay bill. This guy has got slightly short beak. He's so beautiful. And if you check very carefully on his armpit, you can see there's a tiny little yellow spot, okay? Yeah, he's very, very beautiful bird and he's also one of our endemic. He's on the southernmost limit of his range. They also struggling. They're very restricted to their dry sand forest habitats where they could just mainly specialize on tiny little insects such as spiders and other flies. And their nesting is also very secretive. I must also share with you because sometimes some of you will be trying for this species. I know it's, you know, I know it is one of those more sought after ones. So it's one of the secretive species in terms of nesting. So they use, and, and in Falls Bay, where you find them, in the Dryson Forest of Falls Bay, Charters Creek, Pinda Game Reserve, Kusa Game Reserve, Timber Elephant Park, and Duma Game Reserve, they nest into, um, by the, the Lebombo waters, Newtonia Hilda Bandi. Those are the giant, beautiful trees that spread canopies, and they, they have got some special lichens, okay? which is very long, sort of extraordinary. They're called old man's beard, okay? Like a beard of a man, right? And this bird can just pick up those things and then they can just knit it nicely together, including a bit of a spider web, and then they can put their small little nest there. And yeah, yeah, they can just put one up to three eggs into it. They also don't seem to breed very successfully. What is good with the Niagara sunbird is that uh, most of the population seem to be confined within the conservation areas, which, which is at least better because then it means that they're not exposed to any danger. Thanks, at the end. Move on. Pink throated twin spot. Wow, I like this one. Just let's, uh, let's have a look at, uh, at the Latin name for this one. Hypergos margarita. Tattoos. It's a Greek word. Hypergos is a Greek word. Hyper means owing, owning something, right? And then agos means, um, how can I just say it? Multi eyed dragon. Okay, that should have been in the old uh, Greek main stories. Now, looking at this bird, it looks like she's armed or she has got hundreds of eyes below his belly. All right, that's where the names come from. Beautiful bird. But the Zulu name also, if you check on the end of this Latin name, I just included the Zulu name, Makumejana. Right, in the Zulu history, uh, Makumejana is one of the young uh, Zulu Kumeda lady that used to be quite very crafty with her beard. So, you know, when she was weaving her beard, she used to be quite very good. And that is why the bird has been named like that. On the recent book that uh, most of the local bird guide contributed on to the birds of uh, the, the Zulu names of, of Southern Africa, we, we have just been giving most of these birds names to it. Maybe you will have to buy yours. Thank you. Um, Woodward's Betis is also a beautiful bird. Woodward's Betis is also on the most southern limit of their range, as most of the birds that we have already been talking about. It's such a beautiful uh, a bird. Nice, lovely, slender bird, showing that he also eats insects. Well, his range distribution, again, is also quite very coastal. He's very, very restricted. You can also find him in St. Lucia. And if you don't find them in St. Lucia, you can also find them in uh, Temba Elephant Park, and Duma Game Reserve, uh, Pinda Game Reserves, Force Bay, Cruiser Game Reserve. That's where you can also find them. 
and they make such a very beautiful, uh, funny hooting call like. Some people can confuse them with the Southern Booby, but it's a little bit softer than Southern Booby. So yeah, it's one of those nice bits that you could try and look for whenever you come down to our area. Woodwards, Betis. Thank you. The Lemon Breasted Canary. That's quite a very impressive one again. The Lemon Breasted Canary is one of the seed eaters. You can check the beak, it's quite nice and conical, very thick to try and help you crack the seeds. Well, his range distribution is also um, uh, very, very restricted to the coast. Um, but what I want to say a little bit more about him, his habitat, as most of the birds that we have already discussed, is on danger, all right? Um, and, 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 we, and we have to do something from time to time to try and make sure that we, we help out in situations like this. They nest in the lalapams, as, as you have seen. They nest in the lalapam. It's just perching on the lalapam. It makes such a beautiful nest on the lalapam. And you can see that uh, he can get little bit rubbles of grasses, tiny little fibers from the palm itself. And then he can have to position the, the, the nest right on top of an open space of, 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 of the faint leaves of the palm tree. They are also endemics. They are also endemics in the area. Um, the, the male does look quite fairly different from the female in the fact that he has got a beautiful lemon yellow breast and the girl is a little bit dry and drap all the way down. Unfortunately, in the, in the best kingdom, males looks way different from the females. I mean, they look much more prettier than girls, which is not the case with us humans. I mean, uh, yeah, girls look much more prettier than us. So. Yeah, but they're quite beautiful birds, and um, the fact that their habitat is threatened from, uh, it can be fire fires, or it can be any uh, local activities of the people burning the, uh, the, 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 the palms from time to time, because they want to make some sort of lala wine, like the northern areas um, between uh, uh, Cozy Bay areas in Mozambique, the local can burn a lot of these trees, because they make a kind of a special wine called in Germany or Ilala wine. And the only way to try and do that, you have to cut the tree down. You have to bend the trees first, and then you peel off all the outer bugs, and then you cut the tree trunks, and then the sap from the tree trunks will drip into your bowels. And that thing gets fermented uh, within a day or two, and is obviously ready for you to drink. And you can even get drunk. I mean, it's quite very intoxicating. It's very strong. I always ask my people if they want to, if they want to, uh, to try it not to try it while we're bedding, but rather try and, and try it when they're back home. So yeah, we are educating local communities quite a lot to try and ban the Ilala palms effectively in a way that should be sustainable for the survival of the species. Thank you. Rats apelis, rats apelis. Many people can confuse this one with the bat rotted apelis, but let's try and look at this one carefully. Look at the eyes, the eyes of the rats are police, they're black, right? Beautiful little yellow um, close to the shoulders as well. And also the bend on the breast is a little bit more smooth for me when uh, compared to your bath rotted apelis. And also he's a little bit melodious. I've been listening at them in different habitats calling. This guy is a cracker. He's really, really sounds good. I like him. But he's also one of the near endemic and he is also prone to habitat degradation. So his habitat is uh, obviously threatened. If you want to see him, you can also try to see him as far as um, uh, St. Lucia, Richards Bay and all the way up to um, Inyamban in Mozambique. So you can find those bits from there. But yeah, they're beautiful uh, 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 palaces. They're more common in Mozambique than in South Africa, but we've been so lucky to have to have this one here on the most southern limit of his range. He's also um, an, an insect eater. You can also tell this very carefully with his slender beak. So he can also hover in some small little forest um, uh, openings, although he doesn't do that quite often. But yeah, he's a beautiful bird. Thank you. Right. Well, some other special bits in the area. 
So every time in Zululand, you go for one special bet, but of course you manage to get a bonus, bonuses with many precious, beautiful raptors. I mean, glorified raptors. Look at these uh, ginger colored, beautiful pearls he's fishing out. He is so gorgeous. And you can check those uh, black dorsal eyes. Um, he's still missing. I know for sure he's still missing in many people's list. And many people always wonder where to go to try and look for this one. Some people have been to Botswana to try and look for it. Some people have been to Kruger to try and look for it uh, along Okavango. And some people has been to uh, Mkrizi. Yeah, Mkrizi Game Reserve, I agree, can be one of the best places to see it within East Mangalisa Wetland Park. And of course, um, uh, uh, the Pongole River, uh, just after Jasini, is also very good to try for this bird. If you just jump onto a kayak and then you paddle along the river, it's quite way safer. It's not like if you're in St. Lucia sitting on a kayak because you've got uh, lots of crocodiles and sometimes sharks to try and look for any birds. But Pongole River is much more safer. You can just have to try and, and, and paddle along the river to try and look for these species. They're quite more common there. But in Kuse Game Reserve, Luang Kuse, uh, between Mosi Pen, also in Kuse Game Reserve, is also common to see the pulses fishing out. They're beautiful, secretive owls, though. Very only like very active uh, at night where they're fishing at night and during the day they just roost, they just hide themselves. So that's why if you're walking through Kuse Big Forest, they've got to check very carefully on the um, on the fig trees canopy and make sure that you don't you don't scare him off people because they're quite very shy they're unlike your wood owls and any other owls they're quite very shy and whatever they okay they okay along with uh, with the giant eagle owl sometimes the giant eagle owl keep chasing them from time to time so you have got to be very careful when you're looking for them on the right the rosy throated long claw do okay uh, along St. Lucia flood plains there's a very interesting story about the rosy trotted long claw during the early days when I became a guide because my local people did not understand what I was doing. They looked at me, they thought I was so mad with binoculars and, and they didn't know what I exactly was doing. And I know there was unsustainable burning of the Lake St. Lucia flood plain at the time that happened like any time because everybody wanted to feed their cattle. So that's just threatening the habitat um, of the rosidrotic long claw. And I knew what I had to do at the time. I had to go and ask my very same uncle who was aging at the time, Slang Sempi, to try and say to him, look, I've got a problem because now I have trained, I've been trained as a guide and I want to make a living out of this. And if people carry on to bend the grass from time to time, this is putting my birds at risk. So what can we do with it? But the first question he also asked me, it's a similar question that I've been getting through my environmental education with a lot of people was, but what do I get out of it? Now, I had to ask some of my birders who were to come into the area to bring it because he, he loved to drink, uh, to, to bring him the, the, the cliff drift. Uh, yeah, it was not even one liter, it was 750. And they brought him that and they brought him some meat. We had a bri and we and I tried to explain to him. I tried to, uh, uh, to, to ex uh, I tried to translate also the message from the concerned bearers if the activities was allowed to accelerate. But well, he agreed at last and we were happy to preserve uh, the beautiful pressured floodplain. And the numbers of the rosy trotted long claw are like booming. There are more than 80 pairs that I know of in the Lake St. Lucia floodplain. Thank you. Lesser Chakana, it's a beautiful one again to try and look at. It's quite very secretive. And most of the people should always miss him even if they are looking carefully because he's very well camouflaged. You can see just, <coughs> excuse me, you can see some of the leaves. They've got some sort of nice little rufous rusty colors like him. So obviously it's very easy to, to miss him. And most of the time, if he was occurring in the pants where the African chakanas occurs, he could make sure that he keeps on the fringes, on the edges of the pen, because the African chakana always just bombing. Uh, 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 they don't like him. You know, he's so small, so he's, uh, he's easily outcompeted. So, but yeah, the areas where one can try to look for these culprits should be your Muzi pen. Currently, now, if you go to Pempe pen, you will be lucky to see him. And there are two birds, Pempe pen that I've just seen. Um, 
the beautiful birds, some pelvic pans. Uh, you can look in St. Lucia. We used to have some beautiful pans, um, but we've been undergoing through a very serious drought. So we have lost lots of our pans. Unfortunately, we are hoping with this oncoming summer to get a little bit more summer rains and these pans will be back again and these birds must try and flock back again in their numbers. But if you go up to Mozambique, you will get a lot of them again into those uplands pans. Thank you. African pygmy geese, this, these ones are among your 150 birds that you always could try to, to, to tick in Southern Africa. It's a nice beautiful picture because you can see the difference between the male, as I said earlier on, the males in birds kingdom, they look much more prettier than girls. The girls is something else and the male is something else. There are also the frequent freshwater bodies, freshwater pens, uh, 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 along the eastern uh, shores of East Mangalese Wetland Park, all the way to Nibela Peninsula Pens, all the way to Mosi Pens, Bempa Pens, all the way to Nduma, Sokwe Pens. You don't find them at Chinyamiti. If you've been to Nduma Game Reserve, don't try to look for them at Chinyamiti Pen because that's a salty pen. They rather prefer nice freshwater pens. That's where you can try to look for them. But also, be very careful if you're looking for them because they're quite very beautiful. They've got these nice little rufous rustic uh, colors, which looks almost like dead leaves of the uh, uh, water lilies. So you've got to be careful with the binoculars and more slowly from time to time to make sure that you don't miss out on one of those. Thank you. African broadbill. Well, it's one of the elusive um, uh, bugger that <laughs> you should try and make sure that uh, you, you look for him. He's also occurs in the dry sand forest, small pockets also between Kruger and Limpompo, you also find them. But they're beautiful birds, they make such a very, very funny calls which they combine with the display. So when they display from the perch, which probably should be a nice horizontal perch, they just jump and make a sound while they're flying in cycles and land back into the same patch. And at that time, you just check their back, you could see it should reflect a bit of a, a white rump. So it should be a beautiful white rump. So it could look to you almost like a big butterfly <laughs> when it is displaying. But it's one of those elusive birds that cannot betray itself. When it is, when it is not calling, it's very difficult uh, to try and find. One day I've been out with David in Fosby and we look for this David Letualo up north and we tried to look for them. They were not calling, but uh, we tried to use our skills of identifying the birds when they were not calling. Knowing exactly their uh, habitat locations also played an important role because you could at least go exactly where they are and try to play dead, play peaceful as peaceful as you can. And then yeah, you're exposing yourself to more chances of seeing them. The males you can see, has got much more heavy streaks on the, on the breast and has got much more darker cap. The female has got much more tiny little faint streaks, but the cap is not as dark also as in the male. Thank you. Gorgeous Blue Strike, as the name says itself, it's a very beautiful bird of the coastal forest. It's also very secretive. Um, I used to say they're more heard than seen. Sometimes they're very frustrating uh, when they're calling and you've got your clients who want to see them and they can't see them. So the trick to try and see them has been to walk slowly straight where they're calling and try to be as quiet as possible. And then you may be lucky to detect any movement through the bushes and then, of course, take it you know, the gleams of any white, I mean, of, of any red or, or yellow or green should be enough for you because they can be very secretive, but they really are gorgeous bait. Thank you. We can move on, Ian. Thank you. Yeah, this beautiful one with a funny hairstyle is your, um, one of your sand forest guinea fowl. It's a forest guinea Remember, you've got two, the helmeted one, the one with the helmet, and these one have got beautiful hairstyle. They call the forest um, uh, guinea and they also prefer sand forest. So they're not common at all. You don't expect to see them in most places. You've got to be in a dry sand forest, coastal forest, uh, of us in St. Lucia all the way up to uh, at Mozambique, and then you will be lucky to see them. Thank you.
Thanks, Ian. Yeah, this beautiful eagle, well, I say it's an eagle because you can see the feathers goes all the way down their feet, so it's a true eagle, because all the birds without that they're not rated as true eagle anyway. But this one mainly specializes, uh, he loves the monkeys. Uh, he loves the monkeys. If he calls on top, the monkeys go mad about. So he can be found in most of our coastal forests, as far from Shawi, you can also find them. You can also find them all the way down towards Sinfusha, all the way up. Tembe, um, um, in Tembe and Dumo areas, in Kuzi Game Reserves, yeah, False Bay, you also find them. Yeah, they're beautiful birds. They've got very strong talons, okay? They've got very, very strong talons, and they can try to shoot one of their index fingers into the monkey skulls and make sure that they paralyze and finish him off in, in no time. Yeah, they're beautiful. Monkeys don't love them. The characteristic way of hunting has been that. Uh, the male um, uh, calls on top and the female just calls underneath and then they combine that while the male is um, and attracting the attention of the monkey and uh, the female is just getting a chance to grab the monkey. Thanks, Etienne. Next one. Yeah, the Suti, Suti, Suti Falcon. Um, Southern Africa, we've been very lucky with the city of Falcon within Smangaluso Wetland Park um, in an area called Marzon Feather North. It's a beautiful grayish uh, falcon, as you can see, nice little roundish um, eye rings. Um, yeah, duck tip, yellow beak. Uh, we have had few birds coming from time to time into uh, Mbazoni area. This is an area between Mkwiza Game Reserve and Tamba Elephant Park along the R22 road from Shish to Cozy Bay. Thank you. Next one. This beautiful one also called the black throated water eye. You can see the names just says it to Isal black throated water eye. He has got a beautiful uh, waters on top of the eye. And yeah, this is um, yeah, a little bit white on the on the chest and also white belly and the band on the breast. They're also coastal, some of our elusive coastal uh, forest species. The next one. Yeah, some of the migrants here yeah, in this picture should be your African periactic migrants. You call city ten if you can try to spot the black bird among all those other tens. The other tens with the yellow beaks, they are swift tens. But this uh, different guy among them is Suti ten. He has been known to spend so much time uh, of his life on the wing. Many people still argue if you can you know, a pet at some other time. They've been recorded to spend so much time, even sleep on a wing. They really, really are amazing bird. Right, they don't breed here, unfortunately, but we are hopefully believing maybe if we continue, even if those uh, swift turns continue to take care of them, they may hopefully find it a nice place to breed. You never know. There've been many reasons why birds left their own homes to wander into the, the strange lands. Yeah, but as long as they escape now, forever they leave, then they can be, you know, they can change their mind. The next one. Yeah, other interesting uh, bird life to try and look at while you are at Mangalese Wetland Park, especially along the northern tip end of the lake, St. Lucia, where the shallows are. You could try to look for both species of the flamingo. The one on the left is your lesser flamingo, and the one on the right is a greater flamingo. You can tell the difference very well. The much more pinker ones are the lesser ones and also you can see sort of dark pinkish beaks. Yeah, but these ones, they're much more, obviously they don't have um, more pinks on them and also they don't have as darker beaks as, um, as the lesser flamingos. They frequent the shallows where they feed for more nutrients using their incredible lamellaires on their beaks which have to help calm their own food very well. Thank you. The next one. Yeah, the other nice bedding areas to try and take care of, I mean, to try and mention should be Ungoya Forest, which is one of the rare scarf forests still found a little bit inland, um, about 50 Ks from Tunzini and a little bit 60 Ks from the Indian Ocean. It's such a beautiful forest nestled on top of the granite outcrops. And specials that one should try and look at while they're there should include some rare trees, some rare birds, like your woodwards, um, uh, 
uh, a babbit. Uh, it's also called the green babbit. And the guides, um, if you, because Nungoya is doable, obviously on the four by four, especially when it's very rainy, it can be impossible. But it is quite easily accessible because once you're there, it has got like only single one track in it. So you can just drive. It doesn't look back anyway. So if you begin from the eastern fringe of the forest, you can just end uh, towards the worst. So it's pretty or four. But if you intend not to four by four on that track, maybe you intend to walk. There are amazing good guys. There's Sakamuzi Shongo and Junior Gabela. And um, yeah, there are many guys there, Jatama, Duna, Man and Duli. They're amazing good guys who can just take you into those board forests. The forest on the right with a very long border of cough, about 150 meters long. It's, it's a Linza area border. It's, it's been able to provide the visitors with a, a wonderful view you know, of, of that beautiful forest canopy. And most of the special bits one could try and look for while the Edlinza forest should be a bronze nape or delegates pigeon or spotted ground thrushes. Although they can even come down to St. Lucia sometimes, but these are by far the best places where one can just go to check for bronze nape pigeons, spotted ground thrushes, star robin, and many, many more. Back to Ngoya forest quickly some special trees. There's one special tree I remember is called the Woodward Cycad. It's no longer in a forest. They have to take it up to Devon Botanical Garden, so, but it was identified in that forest. Other tree of interest for some uh, interested in trees should be things like a giant Simbiti, uh, yeah, forest uh, mangosteens, and many more, many more other butterflies, um, which um, George Jacobs knows very well. They're of great interest. Thank you. Next one. Yeah, just a little bit about Zulu bedding and the project that we do. Um, you can just get our contact details from this page. The next one. Yeah, the project and the tourism training that we're doing, remember I started up as a hunter, so I always felt so bad that if I can't give back to the community, so it's not balanced the activities has got to be sustainable. So I realized I have to go back to my communities and try and make them become part of conservation. The only way to do it was to try and show them that it works, to try and avoid the question that I got from my uncle the other day. So I am trying to train the local guides to become the bird guides, the culture guide. Those culture guides can just help, uh, you know, take visitors on the cultural experience around their own local areas and make sure that trees like Ilalapam are not bent down, they're not cut down, so that the survival rates of the lemon-breasted canary can get, you know, uh, can get greater and greater. Yeah, because if you don't do that, then it's very, very unbalanced. But I think it's quite very sustainable what I'm trying to do uh, to the local guys. I'm not trying to be selfish. At one stage, one should have to say to me, but are you not increasing your competition? I don't think I am increasing my competition. I'm training these guys as nature guide, and I have realized that most of them, they seem to take more interest in nature and culture, and they always find birds a little bit crazy. Yeah, but it is, it is my love that they should also be crazy uh, about birds like I do. It's very important that we arm our generation with the knowledge of, of the sustainable use of our natural resources. So tomorrow, at least, we are rest assured that uh, these uh, birds and animals and trees, they are left under the very capable hands. So the Camp in Timber Elephant Park, I had to build it primarily to try and make sure that I get as many of these local guides trained so that tomorrow they can at least see themselves as inspired as being part of conservation, especially if they get a chance to try and try the knowledge that they have learned into nearby game parks, because they are being trained on the accredited program, which is accredited with CATSITA, so that they can take with for life. I mean, we test got credits, they can work with whatever parks they have got is registered under the national qualification framework. We got a team currently up in Tampa to undergo this assessment probably in two weeks time. And we hopefully believe that we're going to make up some good guides. Thank you. The next one. Yeah, well, the objectives are already set. The next one, please. 
yeah, this, this is an overview of the kind you can't see quite clearly well, but we call sort of communal pollution showers that can be shared. And we got at least about 10 uh, dormitories that can be shared. And at least we have got three and suit sleepers. Uh, three and suit sleepers for individual bedders or couples who just want to stay in the area while they are bedding. And uh, that can be a best place for you to stay in the area while um, you are bedding. Next one, please. Yeah, the next one, please. Next one, please. Yeah, these are the, are the learners. These are the learners at, uh, at play. They're just doing their practicals. All these are learners at their practical. And checking out the picture on the right, everyone has got to be convinced that environmental education has to start from early years of life. That is why we got classes, we have got programs that we are running with the local schools to try and get the youngsters to be interested into environment from early years of life. And that involves overnight camping, and it also involves sort of fieldwork, taking the kids into the bush and try to get them into early schools of bedding from early years of life. Thank you. The next one. I think we, um, Taylor, yeah, we've reached the questions and answer sessions. If I can Great. maybe just say th thank you so far for a wonderful presentation. We do have a couple of questions. If I can just um, share the questions, uh, if we can just have a look. Um, uh, Gary and Amanda ask, have some rarities such as sooty tern and Eurasian oyster catcher been seen in the area recently? Recently. Yeah. We have I just, have yeah. Eurasian oyster catcher has been seen recently, but for the last two, three days, I think, yeah, we are not able to see it. Sooty tern okay. is still there. I was there, I was there a few hours ago. Sooty tern was among a lot of uh, swift terns. Okay, and then Lester Niss asks, how likely is red-headed quelia? And I think he wants to know where to find red-headed quelia also. Well, red-headed quelia have had some very funny erratic movement from time to time. Ozabeni, section of the Mangaliso Wetland Park, just between Pempe Pens and Manzibombo area along R22. You should try that area and be lucky to see them, but it's always not guaranteed. They've got like very funny uh, erratic movement from time to time. Okay, and then I think someone asked the name of the eagle that we were looking at, the African crowned eagle, I think it was. Yeah, African crowned eagle. And any lesser frigate birds recently from Gary and Amanda? Gary and Amanda ask about lesser frigate birds. No. We haven't, I haven't, I haven't seen the lesser frigate bird. Um, I didn't even see it from the, uh, the, the recent uh, rare Kezatan bird net launched by Adam Raleigh and Ian Gordon, uh, because this is also one of the easiest uh, page to relate some of these sightings now. Yeah. I, want, I wanted to ask you myself, Timber, about um, Nabila Peninsula. Uh, what's the conditions like there at the moment at Nabila Peninsula? Well, I can just say there's, there's still a lot of water in the lakeside, so the flat plain still looks good and green. Conditions are very good. There's a lot of improvement. Uh, the visitors seem to like the age of Nibela Peninsula. There are few lodging uh, taking place on the age close to Sabengu. There is a small little bed island camp that has just been built up there. And that should be used for the visitors also coming to enjoy some bedding in the area. So I can say shortly that the conditions, they look quite good for beds. Okay, that's fantastic. Any other questions from anybody? Um, if you just want to put them in the chat quickly. Um, Temba, have you got anything you want to add? I'm going to close off just by telling folks a little bit about what's coming up at Learn the Birds. But I think we've got some great... Uh, we've got some great feedback. Sorry, there is a question from Margie Hemp on what birds can you expect on the Guala Guala Trail in St. Lucia? Well, it's quite a lot to say. <laughs> it's quite a yeah, lot. No, it's a tough question. <laughs> yeah, the Guala Guala Trail can able to provide you with Woodward's Bertis, Livingston's Turaco, Blue Mantle Crested Flycatchers, Green Malcoha, Livingston's Turaco, Skelly Trotted Honeyguide, green and pink-dotted twin spot, 
So they, uh, there's more than enough. And currently we got a beautiful nest of the black sparrow hawk. I mean, the chicks, they're way big now. Some of you might have seen that on Facebook. We tried to stand quite a bit far away as not to disturb the bed though, but that can be another good sighting if you get to the area to see. Okay. Uh, lots of thank yous from everybody. Um, Derek also says, thanks to Timber, awesome presentation. Christy Nashen, very informative talk. Keegan says, what's the chance of swamp night jar? I think we haven't got to swamp night jar. There's so many okay. birds in Zululand. We need two webinars. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for the swamp night jar, I can just recommend that uh, because most of these areas, they're not accessible in the daytime. So you just have to be here. And then at night, you try the flat plains for the swamp night jar. You have to have uh, those spotlights that you can even plug in your car because you don't need these open game safari trucks all the time. So you can just see the swamp night jar. I guarantee you, I know a few places between Nibela Peninsula and some few places close to St. Lucia and the Western Shores where you can see that. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions? So I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Timber for a wonderful presentation. Your passion and fascination of the birds of Zululand really came through. And I think, um, as I said, I think we, we could have done two. So thank you very much for that. Before I say good night, I'd just like to um, just give a quick reminder on what's coming up at Learn the Birds in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we've got Ernest Porter's um, uh, um, masterclass on uh, bird editing on the 16th September. Uh, we've got Derek, Dr. Derek Keats doing photography tips for novice bird photographers. I think this is more than just for novices. I think anyone who's got a camera who's not doesn't consider themselves as an expert should attend that webinar. And then I'm doing a more thorough presentation uh, compared to the one at BirdLife on birding Mozambique. Uh, that's coming up uh, next week. Uh, sorry, September the 24th. And then we've got Washington Wachira from Kenya on September the 30th. And he's doing a masterclass on Kenya's best bird sites and how to do a birding tour in Kenya on October the 7th. And then Derek's doing a very interesting webinar on uh, buy equipment, sorry, that's gone off, buy equipment, not software, quality open source free software for bird photographers. And then he's doing another one on basic evolutionary biology for birders on the October the 22nd. And that's all from Learn the Birds. Please visit our website and we thank you so much for your support. And we, once again, thank you to Temba for a fantastic webinar. And we hope to see you all in the field sometime soon. So good night and enjoy the birding season.